We recently created a short film for Amazon's first ever Culver Cup AI film competition. But the crazy thing is the whole film was shot, edited, and finished in just about three days with a completely remote team. The backbone that made this all possible was DaVinci Resolve. In this video, I wanna go over the five features inside Resolve that help make both the remote collaboration and the visual effects and editing and color and all that stuff possible in such a short amount of time. Let's get into it. All right, so as I mentioned at the top of the video, this was part of the Culver Cup AI film competition, the short film that we created that was one of the finalists, Skillet and the Jetport Diner. If you want a whole behind the scenes breakdown of all of the AI tools and how we assembled and built the film and the different workflow processes with AI, I've got a whole separate video about that, so you can check that out here. But in this video, I just want to talk about Resolve and the editing process. The first feature that made this all possible was Resolve's remote cloud collaboration. We've got a whole separate video talking about Resolve's cloud collaboration, so you could check that out here uh, for a whole lot more details about how it works. But basically, Resolve Cloud Collaboration, it's a way to synchronize your project files and your media files, either the original files or the proxies, in the cloud so that multiple people can log on to the same project file at the same time and have access to the project, all the media files, uh, and be in sync, and you don't have to deal with the whole back and forth of sharing files, sharing project files, all that stuff completely eliminated. You can all work in the same project in real time. So I've got Resolve, my uh, uh, home panel open. I'm up here in the cloud section. And so I've got my Jetport Diner short. It was the working title that we uh, kept calling it. All right, and so I'm inside our Resolve cloud project file. And the main thing with project files is you'll see down here, there is a cloud sync icon and it'll tell you the status of all of the files that are uploading. When you add new files, it'll automatically create a proxy version of that file. And then depending on your settings, it'll either upload the proxy file or upload the original file that you imported. So then when anyone else logs in, they can synchronize those files, it'll download to their computer and everyone has the same files for the project and the project is in sync. And you could also have multiple people inside the project at the same time. Only one person can be working in a timeline at a time, but as soon as someone makes some changes, it automatically updates, everyone else can see it. And when they hop out of that timeline, they can still be in the project, but when they get out of the timeline, anyone else can jump into the timeline, review it, make changes, do whatever they want. The one thing that I did do in this cloud project that I, is different from what I talked about in our cloud explainer video is I had everything set to proxies and originals. So usually I just have this set to proxy so that it doesn't upload all of the camera original files, which could be gigabytes or terabytes big to the cloud and take up a lot of space. But for this case, because everything was pretty much AI generated, or in some cases I just recorded some stuff with my phone, none of the files were that big. So I had it set to sync proxies and originals. But the other reason for having this set is that anyone that uploads original files on their end, so like if Carol the editor adds uh, some music or another uh, video file, it'll automatically sync back to my computer. So we all have the same project files where everything's in sync. We all have the original files. We don't have to deal with any offline issues because someone added a new file and someone else doesn't have that file. This eliminates all of that. So we had it set to proxies and originals. And then also some of these additional settings, we had it set to allow multiple users to access the project at the same time. This enabled us to both be in the project simultaneously. And also it showed up for uh, remote cameras, but I'll show that in a second about how I use that to also speed up the process. And so, as I mentioned, only one person can access a timeline at a time, but the workaround that we did so that multiple people could be editing or assembling stuff at the same time was we just had multiple timelines for each scene. And so we had this master timeline that was the full assembled film, but then we had smaller, shorter timelines so that I could be working on a scene or Carol could be working on a scene in, the, in his timeline. And then once we were done, we would just copy that and put it into the main full timeline. All right, so Blackmagic's cloud project and its integration, native integration with Resolve was sort of the backbone that really kept everything in sync and everyone working together in the same project and eliminated a lot of headaches. And this by far sped up the most amount of time of how we were able to work so quickly. The second feature in the Blackmagic ecosystem is camera to cloud integration. So I did film some things. Uh, I go over it more in the explainer video of the workflow for the short film, but I did shoot some stuff of myself, which I used as the foundation to then convert into uh, animated characters. I shot myself with Blackmagic's camera app on the iPhone. And so in this app, because I turned on in this cloud project that I wanted to show up inside uh, any devices that are connected to camera to cloud, 
which in this case is the easiest thing, but it could be any of uh, Blackmagic's other more modern and updated cameras like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera or the Pixis or any of their other newer cameras. If I show up here and I log in to my Blackmagic account and I choose my organization, it will load up all of the projects that I have that I gave permission to show up for Camera to Cloud. And so I can see Jetport Diner is here. And so if I go back to my camera, I can see up in the top that any media that I record here will upload to that Jetport Diner project. And so this is just another time saver where I could record a clip. It would automatically record, stop, record in high res. I think it had it set to record in ProRes. And then it would automatically upload to my camera original bin, sorry, my camera upload bin. And uh, it just was another time saver instead of having to record on the phone and then go into photos and download it and then re-import it or connect my phone via USB-C because these files are pretty large and then have to like copy all the files off, which actually Blackmagic kind of sucks at that. You can't just download one file, you have to download all your files. This is by far the fastest way to manage that. Hit record, stop recording, it automatically syncs into the project. And also I could be recording and Carol or someone else could start cutting these clips together. They don't have to wait for me to download the footage from my phone. So just another kind of quick, nice native integration where things sync and they upload quickly. And also with the media, you can see here if I have the media downloaded on my computer or if it's synced in the cloud. So the cloud icon with a little check mark media is uploaded and synced to the cloud. All right, third tool that was a huge time saver was Magic Mask and sort of Fusion in general. So Fusion is Blackmagic's After Effects equivalent. It's their visual effects platform. But the cool thing is it is built into Resolve and you can just jump into Fusion and apply effects to a single clip or build out a whole project. Fusion can get very complicated. It's different than After Effects. It is node-based. So there's a lot of clicking and dragging and connecting nodes to do stuff that you might have done in a timeline panel sequence in After Effects. Uh, but once you get the hang of it, it's extremely powerful and there's just like so many things to uncover in it. And the beauty of this is it is built in Resolve. There's no round tripping. You don't have to send your files out, go to After Effects, export and bring it back in. I know there are more dynamic connections now in Premiere, but you're still dealing with two applications and project files. Here, Fusion, it's all in Resolve. All you have to do is just come down here, click on the Fusion tab and boom, you're in your new project or you're just in a project, there's no project file, but you're just modifying the clip and then you could hop back out, back to your timeline. So Magic Masks came into play a lot because I would take the footage that I shot and I would then send it to Wonder Dynamics. This ended up being not the best workflow. I figured out a better workflow later, but for the sake of time, I would send the clips out to Wonder Dynamics. It would then take my performance and remap it and change it into a CG character with similar-ish performances. And then I would take the CG character. It would give me the CG character back on the green screen. And then I would take that clip and jump into Fusion and draw a magic mask. And magic mask is Resolve's easy way of just drawing a line on what you want to keep. And it uses built-in AI tools. They don't call it AI, they call it like neural um, processing and it tracks the person or what you want to keep and then removes what you don't want to keep. And Magic Mask works really quickly. You just draw over the object that you want to keep and it does a pretty good job of recognizing the edges and removing the rest. And then you got some tools in here where you can fine tune it. And then you just go forward and backwards and track your mask. And as you can see, two seconds did a really good job in masking out my clip. Didn't have to deal with green screen or settings or trying to like clean up the whole edges. It just worked really well. What I realized what I should have done, uh, I just didn't, with, I realized this too late, was uh, I should have taken the original clips that I had, my original media files, comp that on the background. So then, yeah, I would just layer these clips on top of the background that I wanted to use and that was the background. But what I should have done is flip that, put my clip on top of the background, magic mask my face out, exported this final clip to send it to Wonder Dynamics and then gotten back the Wonder Dynamics clip because Wonder Dynamics does a good job of incorporating the lighting into the 3D model that it replaces the person with. Because it had the green screen, it re put the reflected green light into the eyes, which is obviously something I don't want. So that's just something I would have done differently, reversing the order of the tool set. You can see here, I did end up doing that for these shots because if I sent the robot with a green screen shot, the robot was so reflective that it would just ref have green reflections all over the robot because Wonder Dynamics does such a good job. So I would count myself out here. This looks absolutely ridiculous. And uh, I sent this clip to Wonder Dynamics and then it replaced myself with the robot. That's going a bit into what we cover in the other video about the workflow with AI tools that we used. But that was why this was just so handy to have this all here in the timeline 
Uh, you don't have to hop out back and forth with uh, different tools. You can just do it all here. The other cool thing that I mentioned was there is a uh, there's a whole 3D camera, 3D system inside Fusion. I'm just scratching the surface of that. I'm also just not a 3D expert in general, but uh, we're able to do some cool parallax effects for the social media teaser. And so this is just a Fusion composition. So you could make, instead of modifying a clip, you can just make an empty Fusion composition and kind of use it as like an empty After Effects project file and add in whatever elements you want. So what I did here was we have this sort of just quick pan, but you can see there's a bit of a parallax effect. And so we've got a full 3D camera in here using all these nodes. It's a whole separate process, but we've got all these nodes here that stack up and it has a 3D node, a 3D camera node, and we're able to get a full 3D camera, adjust our layers, uh, do a bunch of stuff. I know you could import USD uh, models and other 3D models into here and do way more complicated stuff than this, but this is a pretty quick and easy way where we could just take some layers, do a quick parallax camera animation move to get this cool effect, and again, and also just add some blur and stuff to these uh, the background layer so it looks like depth of field. Super cool, super quick. Again, speed, able to just do this here inside Resolve uh, and not have to round trip go to a whole separate thing. If we needed to make any modification, you could just jump in and modify it. And again, any one of us could have modified this. And also someone could be working in Fusion, working on a clip while someone else is still in the timeline, same timeline, editing, modifying clips. When stuff's updated in Fusion, it just resyncs the timeline and updates. Same with color, someone could be working on color in the color panel while someone is still editing the timeline. And then when they do their color adjustments, it syncs back and updates in the timeline. So there's a lot of really cool possibilities here and a lot of things that just made this so much faster and a lot of great speed. Other built-in feature that saves time, number four, Superscale. Superscale is part of Resolve's neural engine that basically is an up -reser, but it uses AI to get sharper quality out of it. It's similar-ish to if you were to use Topaz, but again, same idea here, it's built into Resolve. We don't have to like export a clip, send it to Topaz, bring it back in here with the upscaled clip. We can just do it all inside Resolve. This was useful, this is very useful for an AI type short because we used a bunch of different models, uh, Runway, Luma, uh, I think maybe Pico once, uh, Playbook. They all give different outputs. And even though if they say they're giving HD video outputs, it's not like a traditional 1920 by 1080 HD clip. Sometimes it's 720, sometimes it's just a weird size. So a lot of times we're having to scale up the outputs we get from the different AI models and we wanna make them sharper. And so Superscale is how that works. So if we go to one of these clips and we can see here that this file is a 1280 by 768, so kind of like a 720 HD file. It is not a full 1920 by 1080 HD file. And if we zoom in, we can see it starts to get a little fuzzy. So on our inspector panel, if we come down here, we can just turn on Superscale. And if we have the enhanced version on, there's a couple other options, but enhanced is the one where the uh, neural engine kicks in. We can see the increase in sharpness and just a little bit more detail that we get out of this. So that's with it off, that's with it on, a little bit more sharpness. And you have some sliders here where you can adjust if it's like, oh, that's too sharp. You can still adjust it down, but we're still getting a little bit of a quality improvement built in without having to round trip this. Now, one thing is anything with the neural engine and super scale, depending on your computer, I've got a pretty decent M3 Max. Um, it would still chug the computer to a halt if you have smart caching on and smart rendering on. So as soon as you turn that on, it's going to, in the background, try to render that out. If you do it for a bunch of clips, we had this issue where we were wondering why was the project, why was the timeline running so slow? Uh, because we had super scale turned on by default and it ground everything to a halt. Uh, so it's something that you want to kind of you save till the end and then turn on on a clip by clip basis when you have time to render out everything and not something that you want to turn on at the beginning unless you've got like some supercomputer. But even this MacBook was chugging in a bad way, was choking, not chugging along, it was choking. The other thing that's also really handy too is a lot of these clips will not be a perfect 16 by nine aspect ratio. So the other handy thing is scaling. And I adjusted our project settings so that every time we imported something, it would automatically scale it up and crop it. By default, I believe it will put the image in the center and maximize to whatever the shortest edge is, but then you'll get black bars and stuff. So we didn't necessarily, we didn't, we didn't want that at all. And so you can leave that and then you can manually go into each clip and scale it up, scale it up, scale it up. We didn't have time for that um, and I wanted something that looked better. And if we needed to come in and modify it, we could. But with this setting, scale full frame with crop. Here, I'll turn center 
crop with no resizing on, and we'll see what happens. I might not modify it because, yeah, so it would look like something like this, where it would, this is a image that is about 720. It is on an HD timeline. So this was, it would look something like this. Um, I think if you, the default would be, oops. Yeah, the default would be a fit. So it will fit it into your frame. It will not crop it, but then you get these black bars. So what I like is to have project settings, which is uh, fill. So fill, it fills it up so that it will crop some of the edges, but it will fill the entire frame. And so you could change the turn that on here in the project settings. Yeah, I think by default is scale entire image to fit, but I like to have the other setting on so we don't have to waste time running through every single clip and scaling it up. And if you still, you don't lose the data. So you can see here, we could zoom out and we still see the top pixels are still there. It didn't like delete them. It just saved us time by scaling this to fill the frame. And last one, obviously Resolve is a great coloring tool because it, that is its foundation uh, for color correction. But I also, you took advantage of their new Film Look Creator, uh, which just came out in Resolve 19 to sort of soften the edges and kind of just take the, the very like digital synthetic look of AI and try to like soften it up, give some halation to the lights, give a little bit of film grain into it. Just something a little bit counterintuitive to like what you would normally think of with an AI film. So the one thing I did get ended up using with this and it was a huge time saver was uh, the Resolve's mini color panel. Um, I'll probably talk about this in the future in a video. I would debate getting this for someone like me who's like, I'm not a colorist, but have been getting interested into color and for like some videos, it's like, oh yeah, cool. would like to have a little bit more fine tuned control. This was great, this sped up. This was way faster than going with the mouse. This was one of those things where it's like, once you use this, and then you go back to trying to color with the mouse, you really miss this. Um, so use this, worked great with Resolve. And so the fifth built-in tool uh, is color. Obviously Resolve's foundation is color correction. It, being able to have the control to do color correction at a high level inside Resolve and use a lot of tools to match skin tone. So I used one of uh, Resolve's available plugins from a third-party developer that's part of uh, DCTL, Resolve's sort of color lang transform language or color language. I forgot exactly what DCTL stands for. We'll put it on the screen right here. But there's a great third-party tool where you can match skin tones. It was a good way, especially with like a non-calibrated monitor, to try to at least get the skin tones to look somewhat consistent from the different AI outputs so that there's at least a little bit more visual consistency in the film. So yeah, Resolve's built-in color tools, their DCTL uh, plugins from third-party developers, uh, and the control surfaces. And again, the speed of being able to do it all inside one project and work on color while someone else is working on editing or someone else is working on visual effects with Fusion at the same time that was another huge time saver. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Those are the five features uh, inside Resolve that helped speed up this entire process to make this film in just three days. We'll let us know what you think. And if you have found any other tools inside Resolve that have helped speed up your workflow, let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.